remarkable stuff um, on Ukraine to join me. And um, part of it is a report back on the work that members of the conduit community have been doing on Ukraine, um, trying to kind of lend our convening power to try and do some quite specific things in response in our own small and modest way, but nevertheless, in response to what we're doing and to let you know what we are doing and to invite you to assist and participate in ways um, that you might be able to do so. I should also say that this Friday, Andrei Kirkov, who is one of Ukraine's most important writers, um, will be arriving at the conduit uh, for a session. Um, and um, we're incredibly lucky to have him. Anybody who knows who he is will know that he um, is a kind of national treasure. And so in keeping with the work that we've been doing on Ukraine, he will be here this coming Friday. Um, and so that leaves me, um, James is going to very ably uh, chair this panel, so he gets to do all the heavy lifting. Um, and I'm just going to say who's on the panel because it's really a, a really amazing star-studded group. So there's Anne Applebaum, who is an acclaimed writer, Pulitzer Prize, Prize winning historian. Her latest book is Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. Seems somewhat relevant. Um, Sir Michael Fallon, former Secretary of State for Defense from 2014 to 2017. Uh, Edward Lucas, British writer and security specialist. And Michael Bosacu, who you will know from our last session, um, who's a global affairs analyst, a speaker and a journalist, currently based in Lviv. And he will be joining us online when we push the blue button and admit him to the waiting room. Um, and with that, I am going to hand over to James. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Paul. So today, almost four weeks after the start of this war that shocked the world and continues to do so, the world is realizing that this war will not be over quickly and that even if it were, the consequences of the Russian invasion of Ukraine threaten to affect for years everything from international politics to food prices. We're going to begin today uh, with brief introductory comments um, from the panelists. We'll then have a brief discussion up here and we'll leave plenty of time uh, for questions uh, from the audience. So um, I think, um, Michael, are you, you, can you hear us? Are you, can Michael hear us okay? Okay, in which case, Anne, let me come to you first, please. So. Um, your, your thoughts on, on where we are at the moment. Um, so first of all, thank you very much. It's nice to see so many people here at four o'clock in the afternoon when you should all be at work, <laughs> as should probably all of us. Um, I, I mean, I think the most important thing to say about the conflict is it's very, it's very important to keep focus on what was the cause of it, because that will help us understand what is our responsibility for ending it. Um, this was a conflict that be, that is born out of, it's it's not quite Vladimir Putin's brain, but it's really the brain of the collective brain of the disgruntled and unhappy Soviet apparatchiks and former KGB officers who were dissatisfied by the collapse of the Soviet Union, who perceived and at that time and perceive even now. Um, the fall of the Berlin Wall to have been a terrible disaster, who think that the rhetoric of democracy, um, the language of freedom and rights, <laughs> the language of freedom and rights, that, that those, are, those are a threat to them and a threat to Russia. Um, and because they have identified themselves as the true guardians of Russia, um, they see all these things as, as, as the sources of, as, as enemies. Um, it, you know, this explains both Putin's growing animosity to the West, to the Western world. Um, after 2011, when there were demonstrations in Moscow, um, he made a very strange series of speeches, very emotional, in which he accused Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and other Western leaders of having, of attempting to overthrow him. Um, because in his mind, um, there is no such thing as an independent crowd. There is no such thing as a spontaneous movement. There are no real movements. There are no real politics at all. Everything's orchestrated. Um, and so he's, he perceived that as an orchestrated attempt attack on him and on Russia. 
Um, he then perceived the revolution in Ukraine in 2014 as exactly the same thing. So he perceives Ukraine as a false state and as a carrier of a, of, of a kind of Western virus that he fears will inflict him. Um, and because the nature of that, because it's so existential for him, um, I think that is what makes this war so dangerous. Um, he very much sees it, and his foreign minister a couple of days ago said this as a geopolitical, um, um, you know, uh, you know, tipping point. This is a moment when everything will change. Um, his form of kleptocratic autocracy will 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 triumph over weak and divided Western democracy. He will occupy a state that he feels is not real, um, and he will play the role, his Russia will play the role that he thinks it should play and that it hasn't played since 1991. Um, it is a direct challenge to all of our institutions and all of our beliefs about the world. It is a challenge to our beliefs in um, the inviolability of borders, um, in the, you know, the, the, the rules and morals that have governed Europe since the end of the Second World War. Um, it's not just about democracy, it's also about principles of international law and human rights. Um, and so it is a, it's, he sees it as a direct challenge to us. The Ukrainians have also perceived it that way and have been very eloquent in describing the war um, that way as well. Um, and I think that is the, um, it's, 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 it's that understanding that I think is finally taking hold in Washington and London and, and, and Berlin. Um, you know, as we realize that this is a this is a this is a challenge that we can't escape. Thank you very much, um, Sir Michael Fallon. Uh, you were British Defence Secretary at the time of the Western campaign against Daesh, so-called Islamic State, but a rather different challenge emerging in this case. Uh, absolutely, and thank you for inviting me. And I can't match Anne's eloquence, and she's right, of course to put the blame for all this on, onto Putin and the people around Putin and to look back at the, histo at the history of this. Um, but I would just like to take a moment to, to look back at our initial response, because I think we are, are failing Ukraine and did fail Ukraine. And I think there are lessons for us. And then perhaps just a word on how we go forward from here, if I may. The Orange Revolution was 2004. That was the point at which Europe could perhaps have done something. There could have been a really substantial and persistent package of, of uh, social and economic aid to reform Ukraine, its agriculture, its industry, and its government. We didn't do that. We said they, we welcomed a democracy. We didn't do anything about willing the means. When it came to 2014 and the annexation of Crimea and the incursion into the Donbass, we didn't do much either. The Ukrainians came to the NATO summit that year pleading for weapons to, to aid their defense. We refused them. I was refused by the coalition government here uh, to supply any uh, defensive lethal weapons. That's why we switched to training, to training the Ukrainian army, because we weren't allowed to supply lethal weapons. It now emerges that since 2014, at least 10 European countries have not only refused to supply the Ukrainians with arms, but they've been supplying the Russians with arms over the last eight years, finding loopholes in the European sanctions. And we now can see more clearly how those sanctions were inadequate. Uh, they didn't exclude, uh, they didn't include oil and gas. And we can now see how uh, allowing the uh, Kirsch Straits to be bridged in the way it was, those Eastern ports of Berdyansk and Mariupol, which I visited, have, uh, have, been, have been essentially throttled. We let all this happen on, on our watch and the where things we could have done that I think we now wish we, we should have done. And if you go to Eastern Ukraine, as many of you here will have done, you do see a left behind land in which companies aren't eligible for EBRD support or EIB lending, where the infrastructure has not been improved where heavy industry relies on single track, steam haul, railway, and all the rest of it. So, of course, Putin is to blame for all this. But um, we have let Ukraine down as well. Now, what should we be doing now to get out of this? It seems to me, uh, having lived through some of this, that Putin will now do as he's done elsewhere. He will double down. He doubled down in Chechnya. He doubled down uh, in Syria. He doubled down in the Donbass itself. I think he will continue to double down. But equally, 
he may now have to settle for less than he originally wanted. And I think there's a clue to that in the uh, transcript of the uh, Putin Erdogan uh, conversations that um, there may be a way that uh, a well placed mediator may now start to explore some of the ground, some way off, but may start to ex explore that successfully, whether it's Xi, whether it's Erdogan, or whether it's uh, the Israeli Prime Minister. I think that's where the British government ought to be focusing its attention, particularly in Ankara, where it stands particularly well. Second, we should continue the military aid. We should absolutely be getting more, as much military aid in there as possible, and indeed going further, helping to continue to advise uh, and to train. Thirdly, the burden, of course, and the appalling price is being paid in Ukraine, the burden of a lot of this is now going to fall on Poland. And I think we and the European Union should now be considering urgently what more we can do to help in Poland. My successor is sending weapons there. Uh, that's important. But we will need, I think, to help strengthen the Polish economy and share part of the cost of all this. And finally, you'd expect me to say, as a former defence secretary, we've got, of course, to look at our own uh, defence. We boast about meeting the NATO target, 2.1%. Romania's target, by the way, is 2.5%. Romania's target. If you go back to the last year of the last century, long before 9-11, uh, before uh, Daesh, before Iranian and North Korean missiles, before any of this Russian aggression, we were spending 2.7%. We will now have to look to our own defence. So, Michael, thank you very much. Um, Edward, I will come to you in a moment. I just think, do we have uh, Michael Bosicu? Can you hear us from, from Lviv? I, I think you can hear us. We can't yet hear you, unfortunately. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me? we can. Yeah, yes. Okay. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, please go ahead. Your thoughts are on the war at this stage, please. Sure. Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me. And I'm here in Lviv, Ukraine. And uh, I, just a few minutes ago, the air raid sirens stopped blaring. Uh, I have to say for the past two days, they've been going off intermittently uh, often, more than we've ever had. I'm not quite sure the reason for that, but um, it's gotten pretty much to the point where I think people aren't paying attention to it very much, which, which of course is a very dangerous thing should the worst happen. Anyway, so tomorrow will pretty much uh, mark one month uh, since the war began. And on the doorstep of Europe, in a city called Mariupol, where in 2022, people are killing stray dogs for food. People are killing stray dogs for food. They're, they're having to melt snow, uh, which what little is left for water. And a lot of the water sources there are contaminated contaminated by dead corpses. That's how bad things are right there on the doorstep of Europe. Now, um, the actions of the Russian Federation in places like Mariupol and now Kharkiv are clear terrorism, uh, viola grave violations of uh, international humanitarian law. And um, if there's any uh, positive news to share with you, it looks like the Ukrainian side is taking um, very strident efforts to document all of these human rights, these uh, war crime violations, because of course that will be very important later on. And of course, journalists and war photographers are playing a very important role in that. Forgive me for hopping around a bit, but um, lack of sleep does that, but I'll, I'll just put a few, few uh, key points out there. Of course, one of the things that tends to happen during war and we saw this happen in the Donbass quite intensively, 2014 uh, onwards, is heavy mining. Uh, and at the moment, the according to the Ukrainian Deminers Association, the size of the area of Ukraine that is mined is actually now larger than the size of Scotland. This is really important because even though mines aren't um, concentrated perhaps in one area, the planting season here is about to begin. And it we've seen in Afghanistan and elsewhere where even a, a small amount of mines in one area can really discourage normal activities such as uh, agriculture. So that, uh, that is something that is not very good news at all. Uh, many of you have probably read that uh, the casualties on the Russian Federation are getting very, very high indeed. Um, according to an article that was briefly in the Russian press, uh, Russian killed in action are around 10,000 now and injured in action 16,000 plus. 
Um, what we're also seeing on the battlefield is uh, very poor preparation and planning, for example, even things right down to the tires used on Russian uh, Federation Army vehicles, the maintenance, uh, small things like changing oil aren't being done. So you're having massive breakdowns here to the point where the Ukrainians are benefiting from a lot of this uh, battlefield equipment being left on the side. They actually have a scrapyard now in Kiev where they're rehabilitating these, these uh, pieces of equipment for uh, their own use. Um, in terms of uh, areas that we should be concerned about, uh, I've mentioned Mariupol, um, and even though there have been arrangements to evacuate people from there, the Russian Federation has been shooting at the convoys that have been leaving. We're also seeing a trend that, that is very worrying of people being um, forcibly told to leave for the Russian Federation. And once they get there, uh, we don't know what, what, what happens to them. And that includes, um, that includes uh, uh, children as well. Uh, Kherson is a big, big problem. City of about 300,000 in a very strategic area. Uh, food and medical supplies there are running out. And in terms of Kiev, um, it looks like the Ukrainian forces are doing a good job in terms of defending the city. But having said that, recently in the past 24 hours, we had that horrible shelling of the Kiev shopping center, which, by the way, is only a 10 minute drive from the um, city center. And just in the past couple of hours, I believe it was the mayor of Borispol, which is the airport satellite town near Kiev's, near Ukraine's biggest airport. The residents there have been told to evacuate. Uh, that, that town is actually home to a lot of airport employees, airline employees. So that's how close uh, the forces are getting to um, Kiev. Kind of uh, quickly to look ahead, uh, I've already mentioned the poor battlefield performance. And um, I think what that's going to prompt is use of more long range uh, weapons, including possibly the hypersonic weapons, which are very, very difficult to, um, to interrupt or to destroy. Uh, we're going to see more use of unguided missiles, um, which cause terrible destruction in populated centers. And uh, the Russian playbook of bombing um, cities into submission. Um, I also want to remind everyone that we, we all often talk about the mass migration of people, of asylum seekers to places like Poland. The numbers now could possibly reach as high as 10 million, and that is almost 10% of the Ukrainian population. Um, having said that, the numbers have come down quite a bit in the border crossings closer to Lviv. We're seeing around, I think, 500,000, sorry, we're seeing numbers where you'd see uh, closer to pre-war. Um, I think what the Russians are going to do in terms of strategy is try to focus on that land corridor that links Crimea with the Russian Federation. So obviously that will uh, behoove us to keep our eyes closely on Odessa. Finally, um, as you know, uh, the President Zelensky has raised the prospect of peace talks. Um, happy to answer questions about that, but I, a lot of the Ukrainians I talk to here and what I'm hearing on the Ukrainian television broadcasts is there's a lot of nervousness about him entering into peace talks uh, just because that um, the Russians are not knowing, are, are known rather for uh, putting down quite uh, unreasonable uh, demands. These concessions will be very difficult for President Zelensky to meet. And I'm talking, for example, holding on to, um, sorry, going back to territory that, uh, Ukraine had pre-invasion, but also there's talk of President Zelensky being pressured to go back to 2014 and demand uh, return of the Crimea and uh, Donbass, which, which he probably should. And uh, I think I had one more or less point here. Oh yes, one more or less point. Um, I think someone mentioned the no-fly zone. Um, we had an Atlantic Council uh, panel yesterday and uh, I think it's widely recognized that the no-fly zone is a non-starter for the West. Uh, they're too afraid, uh, for whatever reason, to prompt uh, Mr. Putin into uh, using nuclear we weapons or chemical weapons. But I think uh, the West should be looking at technical means to uh, put a no-fly zone over at least Western Ukraine. Uh, it, doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean having to put aircraft over the skies here to defend that no-fly zone, but uh, things like a partial iron dome system technology like that. Thank you.
Michael, thank you very much. I'm quite sure we will be back to you shortly with some questions for now. Thank you for an overview which was comprehensive, if in places distressing in its detail. Um, Edward Lucas, amongst your many roles previously, you were uh, Russia editor of, the, editor of The Economist. You've watched and written about Russia uh, for a long time over the last couple of decades. How do you assess the situation where we are now? Well, I, I think it's not quite the end of the world, though that may yet come. It's the end of a world. It's the end of a world that I think everybody in this audience, unless they're in their late 90s, up, has known all their lives. A lot world that started with the, with the Berlin airlift, marked by the growth of NATO and the EU and the um, relationships between the, even at the, height, the, the depth of the Cold War, a kind of predictability about relations between uh, east and west. This is more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis, for those who remember that. Um, Khrushchev wasn't threatening the use of nuclear weapons to get what he wanted. He had a fairly reasonable objective and was um, doing something the Americans wouldn't like in the hope that they would do it. Um, and if you think this last month has been bad, and I talked to many people just beforehand who were saying this has been the worst few weeks of their lives, and that's here in Britain, let alone what it's like if you're over there. I have to say, I think the worst is yet to come. I think we're facing um, the most uh, ghastly, costly, risky, um, unpleasant, traumatizing um, weeks and months ahead before anything um, begins to get um, stable, let alone better. But how did we get here? It, what's so odd about this is Russia's fundamentally quite weak. Russia's got an economy about the size of Italy, um, depending on how you measure it. The West is so much bigger, so much stronger. Um, in population terms, in GDP terms, in military terms, than Russia. How did we get to a stage that um, Russia was able to do this? And what's particularly odd is we were warned. We were warned again and again and again. I'm very glad to hear um, Sir Michael mention the missed opportunity um, after the Orange Revolution. But in 2004, that was 2004, 1994, Leonard Merry, the now dead, um, Estonian president gave a brilliant speech at a conference in Germany, lamenting the West's cynical and naive response to what was then called the Karaganov Doctrine. I'm not sure anyone in the audience will even remember that. The Karaganov Doctrine was he was an advisor to Yeltsin, who said that Russia had the right and the duty to interfere um, in the affairs of neighboring countries in order to protect what he called the rights of Russian speakers. And of course, Russian speaker is not a category in international law. I'm a Russian speaker and Anne's a Russian speaker and you're a Russian speaker. None of us want Putin to intervene on our behalf. Um, but that's not the point. It created this idea of compatriots as a political category. And, and right back then, we didn't do anything because we were ignorant and arrogant and cynical and naive, as Leonard Merry said, and also um, perhaps rather, rather timid. And I think that's been the hallmark of our approach. We are now at a stage where we have no good options. Everything we do has appalling risks and costs. And I think that we in the old West, and I mean here Berlin, Brussels, Paris, London, Washington, DC, need to look at this with a degree of humility and contrition. That Ukrainians are paying the price in their thousands of deaths, tens of thousands maimed, hundreds of thousands, millions of lives shattered traumatized for generation to come because we didn't listen when we were warned and we didn't just ignore those warnings we patronized and belittled the people who were delivering them people like Václav Havel um, and I've sat in the room where this has happened I've watched German officials laugh out loud when they were told that energy could be used as a weapon against Germany I've watched officials laugh out loud when they were told that information could be used as a weapon. I've watched officials laugh out loud when they were told that Russia was a military threat to its neighbours. All these things happened and it's our fault. You can blame Putin as much as you want, but Putin is, it's like a kind of savage animal. If you let the savage animal into your house, ignore warnings that it's savage, allow it to run, uh, to run riot and then it bites someone. Well, okay, it's the savage animal is at fault in one sense, but boy, are we at fault here. And it's particularly annoying when we are so self-centered about it and bemoan the very minor burdens that we're bearing here. One could go into some length about why this is, why Eastern Europe, so-called, was a kind of grey zone that nobody knew about, why we didn't have we had, all our expertise was focused on Russia and the Soviet Union rather than on the countries in between. Um, I think we should probably we can leave that for, we, we can leave that for another time. I'm. I particularly want to focus now on escalation. 
because one of the many strands of our appalling approach to this is we've always preferred not to take risks. So when it was Yeltsin, we said, don't let me, we don't take the risk of the communists coming back. Don't let's push Yeltsin too hard. Don't let's push Primakov too hard. Um, for that, of course, it was don't push Gorbachev too hard. We're always more frightened of escalation than we are of Russia getting what, it's, what, what it wants. And I'm, I'm sorry, because I had high hopes of the Biden administration. I think the Biden administra administration epitomizes this problem. The main thinking in the National Security Council is we don't want Russia to escalate, because if Russia escalates, that would be really scary. Our voters will hate it, and who knows what's going to happen. Well, I don't want escalation either, but the, the result of our approach is that Putin does escalate, and then we lose. And the risks of inaction now and I would argue the risks of inaction over the last 25 or 30 years are actually greater than the risks of action. And again and again, we choose inaction because we are ignorant, arrogant, naive, cynical, greedy. And I didn't even mention that, the enormous caviar express and the appalling distorting effect that that's had on our decision making with those bankers and lawyers and accountants who've been pumping money in um, to our political system and our public debate saying there's no problem here, move along here, nothing to see. But most of all, because we were timid and scared and Ukrainians are paying the price. Thank you very much. And I'll put a couple of questions to, to the panel now before we come to questions from the floor. And I'd like to um, start with you. I'm going to ask you in a moment what you think the West should do now. That's one of the questions we're going to try to answer this afternoon. But I wanted to begin by um, saying many people seem to have been inspired by the Ukrainians' response and the resistance to the invasion. In your most recent article for The Atlantic, you wrote, the Ukrainians, especially their president, Volodymyr Zelensky, have made their cause a global one by arguing that they fight for a universal set of ideas, for democracy, yes, but also for a form of civic nationalism. Do you think that whatever the outcome of this war, that the Ukrainians' resistance can stand as some kind of force that will reinvigorate democracy beyond the country's borders too? I, I hesitate to take it that far because our democracy is especially American democracy, which is um, well, I've been I've been spent the last couple of months in Washington is is so battered and badly divided. But there is something um, very interesting about what Ukraine has shown all of us, and I think that applies to America and Europe and the UK. Um, we've had in you know for the last uh, decade or so, we've had a kind of culture war in the West between, on the one hand liberal values, open society, you know, ideas like that on the one hand, and then ideas about a sort of more muscular nationalism on the other. And these have been presented as opposites and people have chosen sides and there's been a deep divide as to which, which of those worldviews you choose. And what, um, what Zelensky has done and the Ukrainians um, along with him has shown us that there can be a muscular patriotic defense of an open society. Um, and that is, the, and Zelensky has bent over backwards to explain what he means by that. Um, you know, it's very interesting. I don't think there was ever, anybody ever told the Ukrainians that, you know, that in political science, there are different kinds of nationalism and people talk about ethnic nationalism and they talk about civic nationalism. And ethnic nationalism involves being attached to your ethnic identity, whether it's Ukrainian or, you know, or or um, Romanian or or, or whatever. Um, civic nationalism is a different definition of you know it's something closer to what we mean by patriotism. You know, you believe in the nation state and the rule of law, and you're willing to defend it and so on. And as I said, I don't think anybody ever explained to the Ukrainians that there were these different kinds of nationalism. But by electing Zelensky, um, they chose it, um, and so we have a. Jewish president of a bilingual country um, who speaks both languages. Um, he himself is a native Russian speaker, um, but of course he speaks Ukrainian. But as you know, almost everybody in Ukraine speaks Russian and Ukrainian. I, I've been to public events in Kiev where people switch back and forth. Um, and wh whoever, whatever language you're comfortable with is, is the one that you speak. Um, and so he, he has a deep understanding of what that means. And so he is demonstrating for us um, what that looks like, you know, it's a, you know, we are, def we are defending the rule of law, we are defending democracy, we are defending um, the right of these two languages to coexist in the same country. Um, and I think all of those things have been quite moving to people in Europe and America, even if they don't quite know why. Um, 
you know, it is really interesting in the United States where we've had these bitter partisan politics for the last decade, um, how this issue of all issues is the one that appears to be the most unifying. So I see numbers, 78% of Americans say they'll accept higher petrol prices if it, if, you know, in, if it means that we can help the Ukrainians and boycott Russian oil. I mean, I'm not sure I believe that's true. You know, we'll see how people feel about that in a few months. But, um, but the impulse um, to admire him and to admire the country comes from, I think, our intuitive understanding of what it is that he's defending and what he's doing. So, so I don't know if he can fix our problems, but it's a, it's, they're setting a really amazing example. Yeah, it's remarkable when one thinks that he was elected because of his role in a TV sitcom and people Although, thought, well, you know, well, why not? You know, we're so fed up with our democratic leaders in the well, West, why not give it a go? One, just one point about the TV sitcom and Zelensky in the sitcom is that the role he played in that sitcom, I've watched it. It's, it's very good. You can find it on YouTube. It's called Servant of the People, and you can find it. It's going to be shown on TV here. Right, so it's it's very good. But, the, but the, the interesting thing about it is his role. So he plays a kind of ordinary school teacher who's very put upon. He lives with his mother. He's divorced. You know, he's a kind of loser. Everybody's mean to him. And then he accidentally becomes president. He, he starts ranting about corruption and there's a little clip of him that goes viral and so on. Uh, but what's interesting is then as soon as he becomes president, everybody starts treating him differently and they genuflect to him and back away when he walks in the room. And what he was making fun of in the movie was that old kind of Soviet idea of power. You know, he was mocking people for, for having that. And he was suggesting to the Ukrainians that there could be a different kind of power. There could be a different kind of leadership. Um, and as a, I don't know how good he was at showing this as president in ordinary times, but in this, you know, in the, during this war, he's demonstrated what that means. Edward, you want just jumping very quickly on that. Anne and I both covered the revolutions of 1989. And I have a, a whiff of the sort of, intoxicating excitement that we had in those years with people, particularly Václav Havel, but also for the, those who took the trouble to read it, the writings of Adam Michnik and the, um, some of the um, other great, great figures of that age. And we in the, in the West felt um, perhaps not exactly ashamed, but we were sort of in, in awe of the, the, the way in which people who on the other, the other side of the Iron Curtain seemed to believe in our values more than we did and would have made enormous sacrifices for them and articulated them better than our own leaders did. And, and I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a whiff of that with, um, with, with Zelensky too. Thank you. Um, Michael um, Bosakir, if you can still hear us in Lviv, I wanted to ask you, you gave us a very, as I said, comprehensive overview of what was happening um, in the country as a whole. It, it seems that you are able to get information about what's happening um, in other parts of the country. How are you getting information? I wanted to ask you first, how clear a picture does the country of a whole, as a whole have of the country as a whole? Um, great question. Well, actually uh, it's pretty good. Um, what's happened right now in the media space is something which is unprecedented in modern Ukrainian history. You'll recall that previous to the war, the, all the media, most of the big major media here were oligarch controlled and had their own vested interests, political interests. But what's happened during the start of hostilities is most of the stations have actually got together and do 24 seven kind of what they call here a marathon reporting on what's going on. And I think, um, the, you know, given the scarce resources and the fact that a lot of journalists have been scattered or had to go abroad or even into hiding, the quality of reporting is pretty good. And the way most Ukrainians uh, get their information, including a lot of us, is through Telegram. There are various uh, channels there with a lot of um, verified information because another big campaign of the government and NGOs was to remind Ukrainians to double check your information and fact check everything. So the quality has been pretty good. If I could um, just briefly uh, pick up on something um, and said about the, uh, the TV show. I think also what we may see uh, once hostilities calm down is where kind of um, reality or you know fiction meets reality. And what I mean by that is a lot of the Ukrainians I'm talking to are looking at a post-war future where, for example, the pro-Russian oligarchs who controlled the economy, who plundered the economy, who scared away foreign investment, that they're gonna be flushed out of the system here many of them possibly going to Russia where they probably belong or to Cyprus or who knows where. 
So that would be a positive thing. I'm always looking for the silver lining. And the other thing is um, the pro-Russian parties that were in the Verkhovna Rada, the parliament here, some of them have now been banned, at least temporarily, but uh, I don't think you're, they're going to have much of a future in a post-war Ukraine. And don't forget that some of those politicians are still connected with the uh, scandalized government of uh, Yanukovych and uh, were even involved in the suppression of the Maidan protests. So we can possibly say farewell to them for good. And then I mentioned the media, the changes in the media, which are huge. And then finally, I think the fight, for, the fight against corruption will have a renewed vigor uh, once everything is said and done here. So those are kind of positive things that a lot of Ukrainians believe will happen uh, once hostilities subside here. Thank you. Um, so Michael Fallon, I want to come to you for your perspective as a former Defence Secretary. I mean, would it be true to say that in a sense we have both underestimated and overestimated the Russian military, underestimated in the sense that we didn't realize or expect that um, their political masters in the shape of President Putin would order such a large scale invasion, but also in a sense overestimated them for the fact that clearly, whatever the Kremlin's protest, this military campaign cannot possibly have gone to plan. As we pointed out more than once this evening, we're nearly a month in, and presumably this was supposed to be over much more quickly, wasn't it? Uh, that was the Absolutely. I mean, that was the uh, that was the assessment made that all this would be over in a matter of uh, weeks, uh, the major cities would be taken, uh, and so on. So I think you're absolutely right. We've done both. Um, we were mesmerised by this um, military machine, which turns out now to have some rather odd gaps in it. We haven't seen Russian air power. Um, they have a, they have an air force. We haven't really seen that air force uh, in, in action. We haven't seen. Um, combined operations, you know, the combination of artillery and armor in a way that our experts were, uh, were expecting. And we haven't seen much use maybe coming of the Black Sea. We haven't seen the naval operations that we might have expected to help cut off uh, Bediansk and Mariupol on the, on the east and to uh, take Odessa in the west. We haven't seen that either. So, you know, we've been, uh, I think our experts have been surprised by that. Um, but of course, we were wrong about the whole thing, just as we were wrong about Crimea, which base we didn't think Putin would do this. I mean, I've been struck. I, I, as a correspondent, covered the wars in Grozny in the 1990s, and I imagine the Russian military was far more efficient, uh, having also been in Georgia than now than it was then. And yet, the day after the war started, uh, I saw in the Times newspaper here. Uh, in London on the 25th of February, a picture of two young conscripts who'd been captured. And there was exactly the same scared faces I'd seen sort of 25 plus years earlier. Really, it seemed that very little had been learned in that sense. Um, what did I want to ask you next um, was, what prospect do you see of this conflict spreading beyond the war zone, which we see now? Well, just, just on your uh, last point, I mean, there may be a difference between uh, what happened in Chechnya and what's happening now, in that there is some... Um, there may be a difference between what's, uh, what's happening in Chechnya and what's happening now, in that there is much more intelligence available. There is more uh, uh, public information. People can see what has been happening in some of these cities, thanks, of course, to the bravery of the media that's there, but also because modern communications and social media are there, much more prevalent, perhaps, than they were in Chechnya. And um, there is much more uh, intelligence from the air of these various Russian movements. And it's easier for everybody, you know, to kind of see the column of tanks and, and all the rest of it. I'm sorry, your second question was? What, what's the prospects, do you think, of this spreading beyond the borders of Ukraine itself? Uh, well, if I lived in Transnistria, I'd be, I'd be extremely worried. I noticed the Georgians have been very reluctant to, to get into this uh, argument. Um, you know, and that, that is what Zelensky has been on about. If we, if we don't call a halt to this, here, then those countries too are extremely vulnerable, and you only have to look at Putin's rather rather rambling uh, essay, you know, to see what else uh, what else may well be be vulnerable. And that's why I think Poland is so important. I, I suspect when all this is over, Poland will be the new frontier state, and that is where we're going to have to concentrate our help, our defence, and, and and our resources to make sure that their their border is not threatened. Come to questions very shortly, but before we do that, I just want to go around the panel once more uh, and begin with you, Edward, if I may, um, and, and to try to begin to answer the question, what should the West do now? And I want to ask you particularly about sanctions. I mean, we've seen, for example, some very high profile seizures of yachts, uh, 
uh, Chelsea Football Club, just about four miles from where we're sitting this afternoon. I, I see from a news alert I got just before we started discussing is, is uh, the sale seems to be going ahead with increasingly higher bids. But are the sanctions you see so far hitting the right people? No, and I'm afraid that sanctions largely fall into the category of something must be done, this is something, so let's do it and then clap ourselves on the back. Um, clearly, they, they, they haven't been enough because the war's still, the, the war still going on. And I think we are I'm particularly cross with the government for the way in which it announces, I mean, it's a very welcome rhetorical U-turn that we're clamping down on dirty money at last, get to reform companies' house at last and so on. But the enforcement capability here is extremely weak and I don't see any sign of the um, very big reboot that one would need um, for our criminal justice system actually to have the capability to do this. Um, there's also a grave lack of expertise in our intelligence services about um, anything to do with financial um, flows. And the um, bit of MI5 that deals with hostile state activity, JSTAT, um, doesn't actually do anything involving money. So we are, I mean, they, they, there's a good game being taught, but the reality is pretty feeble. I also think that doing asset seizures generally is, um, they're, they're easy to announce, but the, there are property rights, people go to court. It's very hard to know who owns what, actually. So you end up with a sort of alphabet soup of different companies trying to work out which is the one that is actually owned by the person you're going after. Um, there are things we could do to reform that. And my simple suggestion is that shell companies, those are com companies where we have no beneficial ownership, um, should be unable to access the legal system unless you can pr produce a living, breathing owner um, or benefic beneficial owner, then you can't make an enforceable contract and that would immediately push them to the, the sidelines. Um, so there's a few sort of radical things we could do, but the city would absolutely hate it, as would many people who are deeply associated with the Conservative Party who we can't name because they're also extremely litigious, which is another problem. Um, what I would concentrate on right now is visa bans because there is no legal right to a visa. It's a pure smell test. And so I would take the top 1,000 or even better, the top 10,000 people in Russia and say you're all banned from coming to the Schengen Zone, coming to Britain and Ireland and from coming to North America. And not only that, your spouses, your siblings, your children, your parents, your in-laws are all banned. No more travel to the West for any of you. The way out of this is if you resign. So resign from the Duma, resign from the Federation Council, resign from your position in the ministry. Resign your position and your family can resume their studies at LSE. They can go on holiday to the south of France. They can continue all the things they're doing. That would be a, that that would make a would, would be a proper. Um, I wouldn't say devastating, but it would get get the message across. And there's a great deal more we could do on cyber as well. Um, Apple, Microsoft, and Android can basically turn any device that runs their software in Russia into a brick in the space of a few hours by pushing out an update that disables it. They don't want to do that because they say there's, there's a kind of trust relationship between them and their um, users. And when you buy an Apple iPhone, you assume that Apple won't disable your iPhone for political purposes, to which I say, fine, if you feel like that, go to Mariupol. Go and melt, melt some snow and worry that the water has got rotting corpses in it, and then come back and tell me how you feel. So there's a great deal more we could do. We could unleash the psyops. Um, I've just been reading a wonderful book called Black Boomerang, which is the autobiography of Sefton Delmer, who invented our dark arts during the war. Um, copies, I won't recommend you go out and buy it, because I had to pay 160 quid for my copy. Um, it's been out of print for a while. There's an enormous amount we could do to really mess with the minds of the Czechists, um, and really disrupt things. Um, but again, we don't want to do it because guess what? it'd be escalatory. So the people we have in this country and in the United States and elsewhere who've been working on these capabilities, who know how to do it, are sitting on their hands, chafing, because they won't get the political backing to unleash these, um, unleash these capabilities. And meanwhile, Ukrainians are dying. Thank you. Um, Anne, what should the West's diplomatic, military, financial policy priorities be now? So I'm not a military strategist, but I'm, I'm not a military strategist. I, I listen a lot to people who can tell you which particular weapons should be given to the Ukrainians, um, and I would bow to their greater knowledge. Um, there, there certainly are more and different kinds of anti-missile weapons and anti-tank weapons that are much stronger than the ones that they have. 
Um, but the main point is not which weapons we give them. The main point is that I think we're now at the stage in the war where we need to be clear about what our goal is and how the conflict should end. Um, and we need to be planning for the ending and the ending should be the victory of Ukraine. And by that, I just mean that Ukraine should remain a sovereign democracy, um, that it should have some confidence that the Russians will not come back soon over the borders um, and that there will be a, a, some, I mean, if the Ukrainians want to or feel able to, um, they want to, you know, add some language about neutrality, or if they want to, if they want to discuss what their borders might be, um, that's up to them, um, and they should decide that. Um, I don't think we can tell them that. Um, there may be trade-offs they feel they can make, um, but we need to be thinking in terms of that as the end game, and then working towards it. And so that means thinking about what weapons do we have to give them in order for them to um, prevent artillery battering their cities? How do we begin to advise them? How do we get them intelligence to push back the Russians, not merely to defend things, but to, we now need to push them back over the border? Um, the more military progress that they make, the, 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 the easier it will be to negotiate. So I mean, it's, it, you know, it's not really a question in this war of diplomacy or war, I mean, the diplomacy will happen when some when facts change on the ground. So when the Russians feel they can't win, then they will negotiate differently from the way they do now. So, and I, and one of the things I do worry is that it's not yet quite clear, certainly in Washington, this is true. It's not yet quite clear in the minds of the White House or even the leadership of Congress that this is the end game or that it should be. Um, and so, getting people to recognize, I mean, most people, as you say, assumed this would be over in three days, including the National Security Council in Washington. Um, Zelensky was offered a ride out of the country the first day of the war. Um, and so having them overcome their assumption that the Russians will eventually win and begin to think about how the Ukrainians can win is the, is the main goal. I mean, there is obviously, and we've mentioned this a little bit already, there is a lot of conversation about chemical and nuclear weapons and how to avoid um, the use of them, and I'm, I'm not downplaying those concerns or, you know, and then, and there are a lot of people who make arguments about what we, what we can do that is or isn't escalatory in that sense. Um, and I, you know, I understand that that has to be under part of the consideration, but nevertheless, given those constraints, we need to be thinking about what the end game is. And I think that would, that would change the way we, we are talking now about the war. Thank you. I'd like to give um, Michael Bosicu the, the last word before we come to questions. But before I do that, so Michael Fallon, you've, also, you've already suggested where we should, you think we should go to. Is there anything you'd, you'd like to add? Uh, not a lot. I'm uh, with Edward on, on sanctions uh, and, and how sanguine he is about sanctions. I don't think sanctions, I don't think sanctions have uh, uh, brought down regimes or actually reversed policy in, in history. Um, I'm impressed by the extent to which the current sanctions actually do stretch right into the financial system. And I don't think we should underestimate that. Uh, but equally, there are weaknesses, of course, in that they still exclude uh, oil and gas. And as long as they exclude oil and gas, then you're excluding Russia's principal uh, source of, of revenue. We're paying Russia to wage war on, on a democracy. Uh, which seems to me an extraordinary position, and that has to be has to be rethought. It's very very difficult for the the Italys, the Hungarys, the Germanys that depend on on Russian oil and gas. But we've really got to to find a way to find a way through that. On the military side, it, I mean, it, it's Zelensky that it's Zelensky is always who's so clear about this. He said he didn't want a ride; he wanted ammunition. And ever since he said that, the military aid has been going in, and we need to do much more of that. There's nothing stopping us putting military aid in. Um, they have the right to defend themselves. They have the right to ask their friends to help them defend themselves under international law. There's nothing wrong with us supplying weapons. We should be doing that, and we should be supplying more than weapons, the intelligence, the systems, the training that go with these weapons. And we should continue to do that, and as I understand it, um, our government has, has promised more help, and uh, and we should uh, we should all be doing that. Finally, on chemical weapons, we need to think very hard about this. Are we really saying that if Russia uses chemical weapons, as it as uh, Assad was allowed to use them in Syria, uh, but then invited a, a strike from from the Americans, 
Are we really saying that they should be able to use chemical weapons with impunity against these cities? We need to think very, very hard about that. And we need to get some private messages to Russia that there are some red lines in this conflict that we're not prepared to accept. Thank you. I gather there is people in Washington are aware of that problem and there is communication and there are responses proposed that I, you know, aren't made public. So I hope that's true. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, Michael Bosacu, um, your chance to give the view from Lviv, what would you like to, to ask the West sure. to do from here? Sure. Well, very timely question because President Biden is headed this way, not to Ukraine, but to Poland. But um, I think there are two or three things here that the West can still do. And I agree what's been said with um, sanctions so far. But if we could get to a point where uh, if you're a Russian oligarch or anyone in Putin's circle and the only, where, only place you can go to vacation is perhaps Pyongyang or those artificial islands in the South China Sea being created by China, that'd be a very good place to, uh, for us to move to in terms of uh, our pressure on our allies. And don't forget also, Russians, a lot of them can uh, freely still travel to many uh, countries in the Gulf uh, region. So they need to be worked on as well. Um, in terms of um, response, I think we should also uh, think about more uh, funding, more effort going into the Russian media space, the Russian social media space, a lot more funding going in there to uh, send information, uh, facts to the Russian public, because I think the more these sanctions bite, the more they get these horrific um, casualty figures from the battlefield, they'll be looking for alternative sources of information. Um, in terms of military support, much, much better intel, eyes in the sky for the Ukrainian armed forces, surface to air missiles, and especially uh, the switchblade uh, uh, drones, uh, also known as kamikaze drones, some of which have already started to come from the United States. But these are very, very effective on the Ukrainian side in the battlefield. They can be carried in a backpack, set up, sent up in the air and towards a target. Um, also, uh, you know, there's the thousands of people signing up for the uh, territorial force. And um, there's still a lot of people going into these forces, these volunteer forces, with just a baseball cap and a t-shirt, believe it or not. So a lot more body armor, a lot more helmets. Um, finally, I think kind of generally speaking, I think if the West doesn't move um, quickly and set its own terms in terms of response to what's going to happen in this war, we're going to be left in a position where we have to deal with the terms set by Mr. Putin. And sadly, in that interim period, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands more Ukrainians will die needlessly. So I think it's very important that, again, Western leaders develop the spine to stand up to Mr. Putin, uh, put aside these threats, and uh, end this war once and for all. And in, again, in the process, saving thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of innocent lives. One final point, I also see what's happening from my position here in the view of that because of the lack of, I think, Western resolve um, and Western spine, what the Ukrainian leadership is now doing is searching for micro alliances with like-minded states. You saw three, I think it was three or four prime ministers come here the other day, all the way into Kiev by train to, for talks with the Zelensky administration. You're seeing more closeness between Kiev and the um, Baltic countries. So that's going to continue because I think the decision has pretty much been made even before hostilities started that uh, Ukraine has to move to tighter alliances with neighboring states in order to protect itself from uh, a common enemy, that being Russia. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll come to um, questions from the floor. I think we have um, microphones. If you could wait for the microphones to come, if you could please um, introduce yourself and say if you're addressing your question to anyone in particular or to the panel in general. Thank you very much. Start with the uh, gentleman over there, please. Hi. Uh... This is for Anne. In your introduction, you emphasized uh, that it's not just Putin personally, but the people around him. Could you elaborate a bit more on uh, how Russia's interests and actions might change if, say, Putin was off the stage tomorrow? Um, well, this is, this is, of course, one of the questions that I, I, I'm asked nine times a day, which is who would replace Putin? Is there a mechanism for getting rid of him? Um, and the answer is, um, I don't know, and I don't know. Um, 
that what we do know about Putin is that whereas a few years ago, he had a lot of relationships in Moscow, you would meet people in Moscow who had recently seen him. He was, you know, he was part of a large community. You know, he was, he appeared at events and so on. Over the last two years, because of COVID, um, he has been very much in a bunker. He's mostly surrounded by his bodyguards, um, some of whom apparently ideologically agree with him. Um, and he doesn't have a lot of contact even with the Russian oligarchs who, who, um, who are, you know, so important in that country. Um, and so he's, he's very cut off. He's, he's come up with this, you know, these, um, he's been reading these crazy, I, I don't even know where they're coming from, you know, historical documents and manuscripts that have given him a very strange view of Russian and Ukrainian history. Um, and so it's very hard to, um, you know, and he's and he's not he's not sharing those views with anybody except via these pronouncements and statements and and public appearances. Um, the the trouble in Russia is also that it's not even the problem isn't even just that we don't know who would replace him, we don't know by what mechanism that person would be chosen. So even in the Soviet era, there was a Politburo. So there was a there was a clear you know and there was a Soviet Communist Party and there was a hierarchy there and there were other people and we knew what their roles were. Um, Putin, particularly in the last couple of years, has become much more isolated. Um, there isn't an intermediate mechanism you know in the way that there was in the past, and so it's very difficult to say. I mean, having said all that, I mean, it's certainly true that I once years ago um, I once read an article where I went back and looked up obituaries of Russian leaders. And one of the amusing things was I, I found an obituary of Stalin from the from the Times of London from um, uh, 1953, and there was a line in there that said something like, "Well, now he's gone, and now the hardliners waiting in the wings are going to take over." I mean, what hardliners? You know, <laughs> who's harder line than Stalin? Um, and that we have a little bit of that attitude. I've even heard that about Putin. Oh well, Putin is you know, there's, sir, there, I'm sure there are people who are much worse. No, actually, of course, a change would be better because you would have a um, you would have somebody um, who, who would have a different attitude to do events. But but I, I actually don't think we should think that way. I don't think it's useful to think about, you know, who changes power in Russia or who's in control. Um, I think we should, it, there, there's a lot of wishful thinking about that. I think we should focus on, as I've said, winning the war, as Edward has said, um, increasing the sanctions so that they become the kinds of sanctions that people actually feel. And I think that has a, that will have a longer and more useful effect. It is instructive Hi. to read old newspaper reports sometimes. I was, for my last book, I wrote about the reporting of the show trials in the 1930s. And in the Times, then you could read the court report and then it would say obituary page X because the person in the trial had been shot that same night. Hi. That was before the hardliners even came on the scene. Um, Hi, can I, can I, can I abuse the, the, the mic in the corner? Yeah. Please. So I, two, two quick questions. I, I am intuitively... Um, understand the kind of um, language around both uh, an unwillingness to escalate and the question of red lines. Um, but I'd like to ask just the sort of specific question so that everybody can kind of not be vague about that question, because I think specificity around these things really matters in terms of what may happen. So the first question is, if you were to um, articulate what a red line would be. What exactly would a red line be that should cause the West to act? And then if the, the West were to act, what specifically should the West do if a red line is crossed so that we can understand what that is and, and then relate to that, how do we think Russia would respond if we were to specifically act in relation to a crossed red line? Edward, would you like to have a go answering that first, please? I think the red line's already been crossed. I think the red lines have been crossed for years and years. I think you know, using a nerve agent in Salisbury was a red line. Using polonium in central London was a red line. I think bombing apartment blocks in order to come to power was, was, was a red line. And we can choose what we, um, how much we mind about these things, but um, after they've happened, it's, it's, it, it's, it's too late. Um, I think that the use of chemical weapons in Syria um, was a sort of red line, but yeah, it didn't, in the end, we didn't really do anything. And um, I'm quite cautious about this whole discourse, because what happens if you say, it's a bit like what the United States has been saying, which is don't attack any NATO countries, because that's a red line. Well, that basically says you can attack Moldova and Georgia and continue attacking Ukraine, and we won't mind about it. 
So I, I don't like this idea of drawing lines in the sand. It implies everything that's on the other side of the line is okay, and it's not. I would only add to that. I mean, I do think we should have prepared, and 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 this, and I do know that this is happening. I mean, we should have prepared responses. Um, where if there are chemical weapons used in Ukraine, we should have a response ready to go. Um, and obviously, the same goes for nuclear. I, I would say, for example, a very major military exercise in the Baltic would be a good idea right now. I slightly disagree with um, Sir Michael that um, uh, Poland is a very big, strong country. <clears throat> the Baltic states is 7 million people on a thin, flat strip of land with no natural frontier. And we need completely to rethink our defence of the Baltics, and we should start practising that right now with um, going over to deterrence by denial rather than deterrence by punishment. Um, I'd also like to see um, Royal Navy and US Navy warships in the Black Sea. I don't understand why, you know, as soon as this was looming, we should have said we're going to have a continuous presence of our naval, of powerful naval vessels um, in, in, in Ukrainian ports. I don't think you can get there um, without, with, 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 without inconveniencing us. A, we, uh, it, it's all terribly late now. And, I, and the real answer to your question is, it's like directions in Ireland. I wouldn't start from here. We've left ourselves where everything we do is going to be extremely painful, very risky, leave us a lot poorer and a lot less safe. Michael Bossick, uh, can I, I bring can I you? Just, yes, please, yeah. I'll to please come in there because I, I would like to know how this discourse about red lines looks from where you're sitting. Yeah, so um, I think uh, I would have thought a red line would have been crossed on July 17th, uh, 2014 when MH17 was shot down and 298 innocent souls were killed. I would have thought that a red line would have been crossed when Crimea was illegally annexed. I would have thought a red line was crossed um, about a week ago when the Russians uh, bombed the heck out of that hospital where there was a maternity ward and a children's ward. And uh, among others, a mother, a pregnant mother and her child died. I think um, what Mr. Putin is very adept at doing is um, probing for soft tissue and then digging deeper. What I mean by that, even during the depths of the pandemic, when the European Union couldn't come together and agree on simple, relatively simple things like border uh, closures. You'll recall the WHO was insisting that the EU work together for trade and travel restrictions. They didn't. So I think this was watched very carefully in Moscow and also in Beijing. And uh, the moment they sniff uh, disunity, the moment they sniff that the West is distracted by things like COVID or uh, economic problems, then they move. And it's, it's very sad that we have to say this, is that there are no clear red lines at the moment. And even if there were, um, I don't know if we would see the unity that a response, a harsh response uh, would require. Thank you. you. You mentioned Beijing, Michael. I see um, Isabel Hilton from China Dialogue in the audience. Uh, Isabel, and, and it's, of course, very difficult to, to guess what might be going through Chinese policymakers' minds at the moment. Is there any thoughts you might share? Because obviously, just prior to this, we saw that great show of friendship between President Putin and Xi Jinping. Absolutely. Well, the February the 4th statement of limitless friendship, um, 5,000 words of it. Um, and the question is, why, given that Putin was there with Xi Jinping, it, what, what, well, what did, what did she, what did Putin tell Xi Jinping, and and what did she decide to do about it? It seems extraordinarily unlikely he didn't tell him that he was going to invade Ukraine. Given that, it seems quite puzzling that Xi Jinping made no effort to evacuate the six thousand Chinese citizens who were in Ukraine. Some of them building the metro in in Kiev. Some of them students. Some of them have been renovating ports on the Black Sea. Um, but at day two of hostilities, the Ukrainian ambassador, they sorry, the Chinese ambassador in Ukraine, bless him, advised Chinese citizens that if they had to go out, they should put a Chinese flag on the car uh, because every everyone so loved China that um, they would be fine, like some medieval talisman. Two days after that, uh, with desperate Chinese students calling parents saying, how do I get out of here? Um, he had to revise his advice to maybe not the flag. Um, and actually, please don't go out. And yes, we will try and get you out of here. So it, it seems likely that Xi Jinping believed that this was going to be a quick hit, uh, as Putin may himself have believed. Since then, however, the internal uh, discourse in China, including on social media, has been savagely pro-Russian. I mean, really vile stuff, 
um, in, on, on social media. And at the official level, very much blaming uh, the United States for causing this, uh, the expansion of NATO and so on. The call between um, Xi and, uh, and, uh, and Biden was built and described by experts in Beijing as Biden desperately reaching out to Xi Jinping to help him get out of the mess that he had created. So you can see this is not very promising. And when people say uh, China can act as an interlocutor and, and an intermediary, I, I, China has very little experience of doing this. I think only in the six party talks in North Korea did it really play a, a kind of useful role. Um, but the kind of uh, mobilization and knocking heads together that a real intermediary needs to do, China doesn't do. And it's completely compromised um, with support for, uh, for Putin. They share a worldview, which is that the United States is the principal enemy. They share a worldview in the belief that the West is decadent and that a new era is dawning, particularly China's perspective is that a new era is dawning and, and that, uh, that democracy, de the liberal democracy is, is coming to an end. Um, so China is trying to maintain an external experience of uh, um, impression of neutrality whilst signing new deals for gas supply from Russia. You know, and by the time the European Union stops buying oil and gas from Russia, China will have the infrastructure to take up the slack. So that would be a relatively seamless transition. I would doubt that they will supply arms directly because I think they wouldn't want to be caught doing that. Um, but apart from that, you know, I, I can't see them leaning on Russia at all in any helpful way. And it would be quite a difficult, you know, reverse position for Xi Jinping, who is trying to consolidate his own political position for in, in advance of a critical party con Congress at the end of the year, when his term, he hopes, will be renewed and so on. He has to maintain this impression of being the wise and beloved and infallible leader. And dumping Putin isn't really on the cards in that in that sense. Thank you. Anyone on the, on the panel care to respond to that, the, the, the possible future role of China? I think well, pretty, com never, pretty never comprehensive argue, assessment from Isabel. Never argue with Isabel about China. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. The gentleman here, please. Um, thank, thank you all. The name's uh, Ewan Grant. Um, I'm a former law enforcement intelligence analyst who worked for European Union programs in Kiev just after the Orange Revolution and just before and after the Maidan. And I hope everybody in this room takes away the comments Sir Michael and Edward Lucas made about incompetence, cynicism, greed. Those were not the EU's finest hours. Britain can hold its head up fairly high, but I saw dreadful things which should not have happened. We let Ukraine down. My question for you all is, if you had five minutes to ask questions while looking them in, them in the eye to Emmanuel Macron, Angela Merkel and Olaf Scholz, what questions would you like to ask? I particularly ask that in view of the look on his face in the photograph of Chancellor Schultz with President Biden in the White House when President Biden said there will be no Nord Stream 2. I, had a, I saw what was in Schultz's eyes. Thank you. Who'd like to answer that? So Michael Fallon, perhaps you might be the one who's most likely to be in the position to put those questions. So, albeit hypothetically, what, what do you think should it's be actually, our policy Anne suggestions? To Macron. <laughs> Come to Anne in a Very moment. difficult. I mean, you've left Biden off the list. I would certainly like to talk to Biden and ask him what on earth he was playing at in the way that uh, uh, he signaled by his rapid withdrawal from the announcement on Afghan in the, in the summer. His announcement he wouldn't be penalizing American companies after all for working on Nord Stream, the chaos over Kabul, the, the, uh, the misuse of words about some incursion into Ukraine might be all right as long as it wasn't an invasion and so on. Uh, 
uh, really, I think uh, the American leadership, I'm afraid to say this, you know, has been very, very disappointing uh, in respect of this. What I would say to Macron is, you know, what, did you really believe that? You know, did, did every previous French president really believe it? And I'm afraid it's probably true that we all wanted to believe it. You know, that we all, they all went to Moscow, all of them. You know, Hollande went to Moscow, Merkel went endlessly, Blair went, uh, Cameron went. And they all went to Moscow. They all wanted to believe. It's like the shadows in Plato's cave. They wanted to believe that Putin was genuinely different. Uh, and he wasn't. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to eyeball them and say, why were you really so naive? Um. I, don't, I wouldn't put those three people all in the same category. I think Olaf Scholz, for example, has behaved very well. Um, uh, you know, he's somebody who came into office as chancellor with really no foreign policy experience at all. He'd never met Putin. Um, and he, he has understood the scale of what has happened. He's dealt, he's, you know, he's, uh, yes, but he didn't have any time before the event. He wasn't uh, involved with these issues. And I think you can recognize that what he's done is quite extraordinary in German terms and turning around the country and changing the language about self-defense and so on is very important. Um, and so I don't, I, I put him in a very different category, for example, from Merkel, who did believe for a long time that she had a special relationship with Putin and that she was able to talk to him and that she was able to kind of keep him in control. She, she was the one leader who spoke to him most often, and he has a special thing about Germany, and, and she played into that. So, you know, so she, I would put her in a, in a different category, and then I would put Macron also in a different category. So I'm not sure they they've all played similar roles. And I also have to say that I think that some of what Biden has done, um, you know, in the last several months has been truly admirable. I think the use of American intelligence, the decision to reveal it, um, the way in which he galvanized the alliance in, you know, in starting in November um, and warned people about what was coming. And, and I know for a fact that there was an argument about this at the CIA. I mean, are you allowed to publicize intelligence like that? And they decided to do it, which was, important. Um, and I think he, you know, he's made it clear how important this is. And I think he understands the stakes. So I'm not sure I put them all in a, in the same category of failure and blame. Yeah, I, I mean, I, please give the word first to Michael Bosicu and see if he's, uh, what would he say to the European leaders if you had the, the chance to put questions, to look them in the eye and put a question to sure. Michael? I wouldn't necessarily put them all in the same room either, but if I were, I'd throw my Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, in there for uh, good measure. Um, recently, during a European tour, Prime Minister Trudeau famously said, uh, well, actually, we have more and better tools than, than military. The power we have, we have built up over the past 75 years of unprecedented peace and stability around the world uh, through... Uh, Sorry, we have the tools to damage the Putin regime far more effectively than we ever could with tanks and missiles. Well, I'm not so sure about that because, you know, we saw how ineffective sanctions um, have been on Mr. Putin. One thing I would ask them, um, whether if uh, things continue and more red lines are crossed, whatever those may be, uh, whether they consider removing Russia from uh, their, whether they consider removing Russia from the um, UN Security Council, uh, their permanent seat. Uh, there is some, some sort of precedent for this. You remember uh, with, with China way back, the seat, the, the seat was switched, but um, that's something that I think uh, a serious discussion should begin on. Um, having said that, as we've seen with uh, other international fora, such as the G7, G8, uh, Russia doesn't seem to care very much anymore about being part of these international institutions that have been built over the years. So again, that puts us in a tough place as you know, Western democracies, but uh, that's something I would ask them. Edward. Yes, I, I think they are all in different categories. I think what I would ask Schultz to do is to talk to the German left, because one of the things that really puzzles me about this is I can kind of understand for people who take a sort of old fashioned um, you know, maybe nostalgic for empire point of view, the sort of perhaps the sort of Peter Hitchens conservatives, um, that the, the big countries always do what they want, small countries have to get out of the way or they get hurt. And in the end, um, we all do this sort of thing. So let's not get too 
het af about it. I, I sort of can't, I, I, I didn't agree with that, but I can understand that there's a sort of slice of opinion somewhere on the conservative right, and certainly not on your side, but there are people who um, rather hanker after um, Putinist tactics. We see it in the, um, in the Republican Party, the Tucker Carlson types. And I can also understand what you might call the greedy middle, the, um, the sort of people who, the, who I, I won't mention them here because they're all very litigious, but the sort of people who have made a huge amount of money and say in the end, it's all just about making money, so let's not get in the way of business. What really pu puzzles me is the idealistic European left who are so hot on anti-imperialism, are so aware of every little failing of Western capitalism, of Western you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, they're actually demanding intervention in Afghanistan before they were against it. But you know, there's this huge swathe of liberal-minded um, left-wing European opinion, which absolutely gets the importance of minority languages and minority cultures, hates the way in which um, the sins of empire are forgotten. Um, by the, um, the, the form, former imperialists. And it seems to me this conflict is tailor-made for them to get really cross about. They should be the biggest supporters. Here you have a former colony which has been ruthlessly bullied by an imperial power who's exploited them horrendously. I mean, it makes the what the European colonial empires did, and goodness knows that was bad, but what the Russians, the Soviets did to Ukraine, which Anne has written about so brilliantly in her book, Red Famine, is, is, is really up there in the, in, in the worst colonial crimes in history. And why is it that we're still, the, the, the European left particularly, and to some extent also the American left is so uh, sort of crazed with self-loathing and self-hatred for what West has done. They can't see that everything they hate about capitalism and imperialism is there in spades in the way the Putin regime is treating its own people and treating its neighbours. So that, I mean, Schultz would not be um, guilty of that himself, but perhaps as leader of the German Social Democrats, he might like to pass the message on. Thank you. We've just got time for one or two more questions. Just the, the gentleman here and then the lady down here in the front row, please. Thanks. Uh, my name is Barney Jones. I worked for the BBC for many years. I have no specialist knowledge in this area, although I've <clears throat> worked in Kiev and in Moldova training journalists since I left the Beeb, and I've met Putin a couple of times too. Um, but my question is very specifically to Michael Fallon. If you were in that ugly fortress next to uh, the House of Commons now, what would you be saying to your most senior military people there? What would you be asking oppos in the Pentagon about ways that the West could be creative in helping Ukraine militarily? What further weaponry could be given? I mean, is it is it fantasy to think of uh, weapons? It doesn't seem to me that the, the problem is money, is in, in, in delivering stuff, that the problem is the geopolitics of not actively getting in that territory. But are there more weapons, are, are there ships that we could hand to Ukrainians and say, get in there, use what we've got? Are, are, there, are there more clever things the West could be doing? Well, the first, the first response to that, the first thing I think I would... Mike Riddles, Mike. Third time I've done that. Um, the first thing I think I, I would be saying to the generals inside the MOD and indeed to the politicians is this isn't stuff we should be talking about. Um, we should not really be discussing military aid. We should be doing it. We should not be publicizing it. Uh, what's, what's really important is these weapons get into the hands of the Ukrainian army, not that particular uh, governments around the world should claim credit for supplying a thousand of this or 500 of that. And, you know, I think that's far better uh, in helping the Ukrainians that the Russians don't exactly know who is supplying what. So I would take it completely off the airwaves. Secondly, you're right. I mean, we have a huge inventory here. And, um, you know, the others do too, the French particularly. We have a huge inventory. And there is plenty there that can be simply gifted. Uh, one of the reasons one of the reasons, and there were other reasons, I'm afraid, why we did not supply weapons in 2014, because we had a coalition government. Uh, but one of the reasons it was so difficult to supply weapons was we had absurdly strict rules about gifting. Uh, when the Ukrainians wanted anti-tank weapons in a hurry, you had to lay papers before the House of Commons and they couldn't, they had to lay there for 30 days before you could make the supply and all that. So I would look into that and get all that completely speeded up so that we could actually, as you suggested, gift 
some of our equipment without worrying about the particular value of it. Uh, and thirdly, I'd be looking at some of the more specialist stuff, uh, the offensive cyber capability that we have, um, some of the missile systems that we have that we're now starting to think about supplying, some to, some to Poland, uh, but some of the more sophisticated weaponry that we have, I would start supplying that. Thank you very much. And last question to, to the lady in the front row, please. Um, not sure if it is on. Um, Carol Allen's story. I'm a photojournalist. And uh, one of the things that the, the discussion today is, 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 is scary in terms of what we didn't do. And perhaps where is the optimism? So the question to the panel is looking at this president that probably most of the world could not pronounce his name or knew who he was. And all of a sudden, everyone knows who Zelensky is and the kind of leadership and the kind of role that he's playing from the very beginning of the soundbite, perhaps as part of his training as uh, being an actor and, and so on. You know, uh, I don't need a free ride, I need weapons and so on. How important do you think Zelensky is right now in being able to weave perhaps a magic wand to get the West really behind what is required and for them to rethink and strategize what is the best way forward rather than being locked into the old way of doing things. How important is President Zelensky himself? Zelensky is obviously very important. Um, he's somebody who, um, partly because of what he did most of his life and the people he's surrounded with, he has a very good sense of how to communicate and he's, you know, you know, he and he's well prepared to do it. And also, I think the, his feelings are authentic, and so and you can tell. Um, but I also think that the one of the most inspiring things coming out of this war is also the behavior of a lot of ordinary Ukrainians, people who aren't the president, um, very ordinary people who've gone to help in the territorial army. Um, several people who I know who stayed in Kiev in order to be either work as journalists or to. Um, help in either with refugees or even with just food distribution. Um, you know, the way in which the country has galvanized um, is truly impressive. And, you know, all of us in this room, you know, live in very divided societies where we have partisan debates all the time and we should be inspired by the unity of the Ukrainians. Thank you. Uh, Sir Michael. Thank you. Yes, I think we should applaud Zelensky for his, the moral clarity he's brought to all this, um, for the shaming of the West that he's, that he's um, uh, developed in his addresses to the different parliaments around the world, um, and not so much for galvanizing the rest of the world, but for galvanizing his own people, and for galvanizing that sense of national identity, which I've seen growing in Ukraine, actually, fostered by the way that Russia has behaved in the Donbass, but he has really crystallized it and galvanized it. I think finally Zelensky actually you know, is, is a beacon of hope in one other respect. Uh, Ukraine was a, a very immature, corrupt, clunky democracy dominated by oligarchs. Actually, democracy in the end worked. You know, they threw out the oligarchs. Zelensky got elected. And we shouldn't forget that. And that, you know, that is what the Ukrainians are fighting for, and that is what we should be supporting them in. Edward Lucas, final thought um, from you. Hands up everyone in the audience who knows the name of the Ukrainian Prime Minister. Not Bishop, you can't do that. Anyone apart from Bishop Kenneth, who is the Ukrainian uh, Bishop here in London, you know, yes, okay, so we've got, it, so I think that rather proves the point. He's actually Denis Shmyar, and uh, our own um, dear Defence Minister was easily fooled when this man appeared on the, um, to do a video call, and it was in fact a Russian prankster. Um, so it's a huge burden, but I have to say, I. I, I slightly, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at desperate messages from people who really believed in our values and who were let down. When I was writing my book, Deception, I found a message sent by the Lithuanian um, partisans who were fighting um, Soviet occupation in 1946, and they were appealing to us, uh, citing the values of the Atlantic Charter and saying, if you really believe in these values, why are you leaving us to be massacred in the Woods by the NKVD. Um, there's messages from the Warsaw Uprising um, from 1944. There's the famous radio broadcast, which many of you will have heard. It's used every time the Hungarian Uprising is um, on the radio of the message, the last 
I think, yes, the last message in English from Hungary as the Soviet tanks rolled in. And I didn't want to be in a position where we are sitting there admiring the extraordinary courage of an amazing leader in absolutely terrible circumstances. He shouldn't be in these circumstances. Ukrainians shouldn't be in these circumstances. And it, it's almost a kind of, it's not quite war porn, it's sort of disaster porn. We sit there luxuriating in this sort of extraordinary um, political moment where we see uh, you know, him telling the Germans, Nie wieder, telling the, and tear down the wall, telling the, um, the British, we'll fight them on the beaches, which is what he meant to say, unfortunately, his interpreter mistranslated, said, we'll fight them on the shores, which doesn't sound quite so, so good. And, it, and it's all wonderful. We should just again and again, I want to finish on this, we should be asking ourselves, why did we leave him to be the last best hope? Thank could you. I, could I just and yes, in my last quickly. word to you, please, yeah. Thank you. I always love having the last word. Um, yeah, it's very interesting to watch the wave of popularity of Zelensky globally, uh, because I think there's a little bit of a different view here, especially in Western Ukraine, which, by the way, was not very pro Zelensky during the election, was more pro Poroshenko. Um, it's going to be interesting to watch how uh, Zelensky and Poroshenko recon reconcile the differences. Poroshenko is on the news every night here, <clears throat> oftentimes in battle fatigues. Um, and don't forget that pre-war, um, the Zelensky government was trying to prosecute Mr. Poroshenko for treason. So uh, hopefully those internal differences uh, will be resolved. I also would like to see Mr. Zelensky make, for example, much more effective use of his very skilled diplomatic service. By the way, a lot of them are women, uh, who, especially the ambassador to the United States, people like that, because he does have a very tight inner circle. And he does tend to go through ministers very quickly. And he has uh, dispensed of a lot of technocrats early on in his administration. And one more quick thing, Mr. Zelensky will need a lot of support from the West henceforth. Um, and I'm thinking especially uh, by a bigger power such as China. Um, earlier this year, or actually a few months ago, China tried to strong arm Zelensky forcing Ukraine to take its name off a UN human rights petition, criticizing China's uh, treatment of the Muslim minority. Otherwise, they were going to stop a shipment of 250,000 COVID vaccines bound for Ukraine. That's the way they act. So Zelensky um, has a lot, of, is going to have a heck of a lot on his plate, including reconstruction, things like that. But uh, we all hope, of course, that things up, turn out for the best and that he he's able to um, use a lot of the support that the West has promised to rebuild a even stronger democracy than existed before. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Bosakul, joining us from uh, Lviv. Thank you too to Edward Lucas, Sir Michael Fallon and Applebaum. Thank you very much to The Conduit and to Pranvira Smith for organizing. And thank you very much for you, for your participation, for your questions, both here and online. Thank you. And if I may just swoop in before uh, uh, people depart. Paul mentioned that there'll be a town hall meeting at 6 p.m., which you're 